Good morning and happy Lunar Landing Day. It's great to have you all here. I'm Tracy Land, Chief Operating Officer here at Space Center Houston. We are the Visitor Center for NASA Johnson Space Center as a nonprofit entity. We're also a Smithsonian affiliate, and we are the world's first certified autism center as a science center. We believe uh, very much in equity, inclusion, accessibility, and we we take that on as a great badge of honor that our staff has had expert training training to ensure that our that our staff is able to work with people who have any type of learning disabilities or any type of challenges or anything like that. If you see that there's a need that we're not meeting, please let us know because we always want to improve. So welcome today for our first panel discussion. You know, I spent over 20 years of my life with NASA and industry, and I, I tell you, I've been around a lot of folks, been around the flight controllers and directors over the last uh, four years that I've been here had just been a, a fantastic experience for me. Many of these gentlemen we've been involved with either planning discussions like this or have been a part of the mission control that has been restored as a National Historic Landmark where they actually had the missions from mid Gemini all the way up through shuttle but also included the lunar landing for Apollo 11 and many other great space flights. If you have not got your ticket for that, hopefully you will today. They will go quick and I will have to say I apologize if you're not able to go today because we run that on a, on a quick circuit and but we're going to be open for quite a long time today so uh, hopefully you'll be able to get that and see if you're going to be uh, back tomorrow off so that uh, you may be able to do that too. It was a great opportunity for us to partner with NASA Johnson Space Center. Uh, we did the fundraising for them as they're a federal agency and cannot do that. Worked with them in the city of Webster uh, gave a large contribution for that, uh, $3.5 million of $5 million for that restoration. So today with our first panel, we thought it would be best to uh, have a discussion as we're talking about the lunar landing, talk about lunar module development and operational issues to start out with. And they'll, these are quick presentations and discussions. We really wanted to have uh, some commentary from the audience as well. And we do have that. We'd ask that you have a quick question so that we can uh, also have others that can answer, uh, ask questions and our gentlemen able to answer those. So first, and I'll, I'll allow them to, uh, I'm gonna introduce my name and then I'll allow them to give a quick synopsis of what they did when they were in mission control. So first is, uh, to my right here is Richard Kuko. Richard. Bill Reeves in the middle. And Jack Knight on the far end. Richard, why don't you start us off? Okay, uh, I see I graduated college in 1966 and went to work for Grumman Aer Aircraft Company at the time. Uh, I uh, started testing the environmental control systems uh, on the lunar module. Up closer to my. And that, and that worked, uh, uh, that involved uh, atmospheric revital revitalization system which involved getting CO2 out of the atmosphere because in a closed environment like that, you have to scrub it otherwise you're in trouble. Uh, it was cabin pressure management and all those life support type things this was my focus uh, during the testing and development phases. Bill? Good morning. Uh, I'm Bill Reeves. I uh, grew up in Arkansas and got here as fast as I could. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I, uh, I joined here in 1967 and went straight to the flight control division and was a flight controller on the lunar module in the electrical power system group. Uh, we were responsible for all of the power systems, which on the limb was just batteries, and uh, the distribution system and keeping track of power profiles. And we also uh, were in charge of the pyrotechnic devices that uh, separated the stages and open valves and all that kind of stuff. 
So uh, we were, I was, I was in the back room, which is called the vehicle system su staff support room, and uh, we were the people that made the people in the front room look good. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, I uh, was 25 years old when Apollo 11 landed, and uh, was on the previous shift and wasn't actually on during the landing, but none of us left from shift to shift. We all hung around and watched it, so turn it over to Jack. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, <clears throat> Jack Knight, I was a member of an Air Force family that uh, bounced around the world a number of times, or a number of places, and I went to Georgia Tech, graduated in 1965, and came straight here at the Manned Space Flight Center, again, also in operations, and uh, was assigned to the lunar module. But the lunar module wasn't quite ready at the time, so I participated in the Gemini and the Agena uh, programs a little bit. But uh, once they were over, the uh, Apollo moved on, moved out. The uh, first lunar module was an unmanned, and I was involved in that. That was launched on a Saturn 1B, went around the Earth a few times, and, the, and it automatically executed some of the critical events that had to happen, such as trying to burn a descent engine, staging, burning an ascent engine. And of course, since it didn't have any people on board, my parts were just, it kept atmospheric integrity. Uh, after, uh, after that, uh, we started to really pick up and I was involved in all the limb uh, uh, man flights, Apollo 9 through Apollo 17. And I was uh, started out in the ECS air back room and then was out in the uh, MOKER for all the uh, uh, Apollo 9 and subsequent and I was um, on Apollo 11, my shift was right after the landing shift, so I waited in the, in the SSR for that to happen and then uh, came out immediately thereafter for the EVA. So got to see Armstrong step on the moon and the rest of the EVA. The uh, subject of this was issues, uh, and there are a, a, a quite a number of them. I think, uh, as, as all, on all the vehicles, the command and service module, should I go? Sure. As well as the lunar module. And of course, everyone is probably aware we had the uh, Apollo 1 fire. That set things back a little bit, but uh, we kept progressing and managed to get past that, rebuild the interior of the command service module. The lunar module was running in parallel with all that. The uh, source of number of interesting things to me later on, and they were in areas that were not my specialty, but in particular, the uh, limb ascent engine. Uh, NASA had a, a process by which if they had uh, uncertainty in particular areas, they would often uh, put two contractors to work. And so the first one that came up with a good solution they were, you're it, you'll do the rest of it, and the other guy that was paid and moved on to other things. The, in this particular case of the ascent engine, the uh, problem was uh, the injector. They did manage to make it work, but as it turns out that uh, you could only fire the engine once, so that n the, no ascent engine was ever tested other than the development period by firing its complete session, uh, complete uh, parts until it launched from the moon. Uh, so to me, that's a kind of interesting thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was simple, so uh, you knew it would work once and that's all it needed to work. And uh, every, every, every one of them did. There was another, uh, you wanna speak to that, Rich? Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to chime in on Bill Reeves' comment about uh, being in the SSRs. Uh, I was in what they call the MER, uh, Mission Evaluation Room, working uh, back room to those guys, and we helped them look good. <laughs> <laughs> that, As you can see, there's a lot of healthy uh, discussion here. They've only had about 50 years to kind of work up to this, so it's working very well. That, that is a fact. And uh, 
that was the beauty of, of the Flight Ops organization, was it was a very competitive environment. And, and I've always thought that the unsung heroes of the program were the training people that, uh, that trained all of us and, and put together the simulations and threw all the failures in and, and all that. Uh, those people were behind the scenes and really did a great job. But uh, talking about issues, uh, how many of you all have heard, have seen the lunar module described as the LEM? You know, you know, a lot of old documentation, in fact, when I first got here, there was still a lot of documentation they called it the LEM, which stood for Lunar Excursion Module. And the, the original design of the vehicle was for to land and be able to move around, but that was dropped way early on for cost and weight reasons. And, and so they reduced the name to the Lunar Module, the LM. So there's your trivia question for the day. <laughs> Uh, but the, the power system in the lunar module that I was working on was strictly batteries. It was silver zinc batteries. And, and, and our, our main uh, focus was, you know, making, we would take the checklist that was being developed at the time as to what we were going to do. And we had to resolve the checklist into power draw as, so that we knew at any point in time how much power was being drawn out of the batteries and how much time we had left. And there were four major batteries in the in the decent stage that were on during landing. And then there were two batteries that powered the ascent stage when they left the moon to go back to the command module. And one of the big design issues that we ran into was <coughs> the, uh, the ascent batteries were on in parallel on the power buses with the decent batteries during the landing in case you had to abort. And, and you had to abort the landing and, and to stage the vehicle and go back to the command module. And what we found out was that uh, the ascent batteries, which had not been used for quite a while, uh, time-wise, uh, in the mission, were sitting on coal plates and they were getting very, very cold. And, uh, and silver zinc batteries had a characteristic where uh, the voltage was very unstable for the first uh, 10 or 12 amp hours out of the battery before the voltage got stable. And uh, we found out that uh, if you stage the vehicle without getting that first 10 or 12 amp hours out of the batteries, the voltage on the bus would drop during the staging to the point it would dump the computer and, and affect a lot of equipment. So we had to come up with a power scheme to put the batteries on, I mean, the ascent batteries on at a certain point in time to get them to pick up the load and, and get that, uh, get that preconditioning out of the way. So that was, that was quite a challenge to do that. And during the mission, we found out that, that it, they weren't drawing as much as they were supposed to. And so we wound up having to play some games with it, but all's well that ends well. <laughs> go ahead, Richie. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to point out, point out that uh, if you go out, wander around out here, there's that uh, lunar module thing hanging from the sky. <laughs> well, that was the uh, lunar test article number eight, and uh, uh, that I uh, accompanied down here uh, from Bethpage, where Grumman was located. Uh, and put it through a full series of tests to validate that the environmental control system as well as the thermal control system uh, could manage and keep the vehicle from getting too hot, too cold, and, and help the equipment make sure that the equipment didn't get too hot. Uh, there, as I said before, in space there's no atmosphere. Heat gets carried away only by direct contact with coal plates. And that was what, what, what Bill was, was talking to. Uh, I had a little more. The, 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 uh, that vehicle was was brought down here and put in the uh, what's the space environment uh, lab out on the back part of the center, and it's it's uh, it's a great it's a huge vacuum chamber, and they would uh, pull pull a vacuum, uh, run liquid nitrogen through the uh, walls, and they also had a number of uh, lights that simulated sunlight. So the lunar, unlike the command module, which was always in space and was all it was rotating, so it kind of barbecue, and so the sun would see different sides, or it would see different the sun on different sides of the vehicle constantly. The lunar module, once it sat on the surface, had 
sat there and it did not barbecue. So the solar, wherever the sun was, it was, it was going to impinge on that part of the lunar module all the time that it was there. So it, its thermal design was different and validating that thermal design was done out there in that chamber, uh, among other things uh, was done there. Uh, another, um, I don't know what to call it, an issue or not, but uh, one of the things that came up, particularly during, uh, there was a number of, of changes that were made to the lunar module, fairly, fairly minor, once it arrived at, at Kennedy, uh, one of which was that uh, during testing down there, the limb would get to the Cape, and Cape would put it in a chamber down there, and the, the crewmen would get in it. And one of the things that uh, happened very kind of late in Armstrong's flight, Apollo 11, was he, he indicated he was too warm being in the, uh, in the lunar module, in the chamber. And at that time, it was only uh, air-cooled, air blowing through the suit and out. And our, plan, our plans always had been to, when we were landing, that the crew was completely suited. So the only cooling was airflow, and, and he got too warm. So uh, they, the, because they were also going to be on the lunar surface, they were wearing a liquid cooling garment, which is a fabric that had a water tubes running through it. And f when you were in a suit with a portable ice sports system, it ran water through that for cooling. It just didn't have enough capacity just for air cooling, and the crew was working, would be working too hard. So. Uh, after that, Grumman very quickly built a, a little pump and tubing system and put a heat exchanger in, the, in that lunar module and then all subsequent ones while it was at the Cape and, and that was made available so that when uh, we got to the moon, the crew could plug in those little water tubes and use those while they were still in the lunar module. So, that, and there were other, I think there were other changes made at the Cape late in the game when certain uh, subjects came up, but that capability was there. Uh, for, for our operations, I'm on a slightly different tack. One of the uh, agreements we had with each of the contractors, Grumman for the Lunar Module and North American for the Command Service Module, was those companies provide technical representatives that had contacts back to the factory to flight operations because we were making drawings and procedures and malfunction procedures, normal procedures. And those contacts were very valuable because they knew the people back at the plant and they could call and get information somewhat easier than a voice nobody had ever heard. That was one of the, uh, I think, fairly key uh, decisions that was made in the program was willing to pay for. Uh, another, another big problem with the lunar module was when it was first built, uh, it turned out to be too heavy and, and it was way overweight. And you've heard a lot of stories about Apollo 10, which was a complete dress rehearsal for Apollo 11, where it went to the moon, did everything except land. Uh, the limb had gone through a massive weight reduction program to get the weight down to where it, where it could land and take back off. And uh, Apollo 11 was the first lunar module that had gone through that weight reduction program. So the lunar module that was on Apollo 10 w was too heavy anyway. And, and even you've seen articles about fuel was offloaded out of the ascent stage so that, so that they wouldn't land. And uh, <coughs> that's... That's really not true. It was offloaded to reduce the weight of the vehicle and, and, uh, until we got through the weight reduction program. Yeah, from my perspective, uh, that weight reduction program, first of all, affected the thickness of the skin uh, on the lunar module itself, so it was more like an oil can than anything else. It, would, it actually, when we were testing, we'd hear it go pop, pop, pop. Uh, we pressured it up. And uh, also, uh, in that rate weight reduction program, they went from, what, 18-gauge down to 22-gauge wire or something like that, so it got really thin. And guess what? When the people working on the vehicle touched those things, they broke the connections. They broke the wires, and it was a massive amount of time spent troubleshooting where the brake was. 
Another, another little trivia question or statement was uh, uh, the lunar module was a unique vehicle because it only flew in a vacuum and, and, and only had to, to land on the moon and get back off and, and not re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. So us LIM guys always had a motto that heat shields were for sissies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I guess turnabout's fair play. <laughs> Jack, uh, <laughs> follow that. It's hard. That one's a hard one to follow. Uh, yeah, I do remember that he feels the decisions, but they had a comeback, which escapes me at the moment. I was trying to remember that. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember it, unfortunately. It was 50 years ago, and some, some things I know have some, gone, something gone Something to the me. effect of you're not getting home without it, so. <laughs> uh, Grumman, Grumman had a reputation. Grumman at the time uh, made, made, made aircraft for the Navy, so those things had to land on carriers, and they had a lot of experience and, re and reputation for structures. And structures was, again, part of the lunar module was it had to land on the moon. And in order, you, you, can't, you can't just assume that you're gonna land on a nice flat surface. You had to account for, you might be also falling straight down. You might be going so much forward, so much to the left or the right, uh, and then some rate of descent. And so they had to account for all, and the surface might be tilted. So all of that had to be built into the design of the struts. The struts were honeycombed uh, aluminum, so they just crushed. It, there was no spring or anything like that. They just would crush. And uh, also, uh, early on, there was a, a, a scientist named uh, Thomas Gold, I think he was. You can find him online. He, he, he had a very good reputation, but he also had a reputation for uh, assuming certain far out things. And one of the things he mentioned was there was a possibility that uh, the, the lunar dust on the moon would be very loose and very deep, and it could be 40 feet deep. And so if the lunar module could just disappear. <laughs> uh, now, n nobody knew that for certain. And, and we frankly, uh, but other people thought differently and, and uh, designed it differently. They, we did find out, the, if you have ever looked back in history, uh, our first uh, uh, satellite, not satellite, but sh uh, moon shots were called Ranger. Ranger shot straight from the Earth to the moon, went straight in and crashed, but while it was going in, it had a camera and it snapped pictures, snapped pictures, and so you'd get close, 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 closer, and you'd get a of the field that you that might be a landing a landing spot and so those provided information about certain information about landing areas the other one that followed that was surveyor surveyor landed directly on the moon it had three landing gear and it had pads that would give you information about whether you were going to sink or not and how much uh, pounds per square inch you could, the lunar surface would support. So we found out what the reality was with those, those missions. So that when the lunar module was designed, the foot pads took that kind of thing into account. So the area of those pads, we had pretty good idea there was not gonna be a problem provided the surface you landed on was within the angles that uh, were designed to, so you wouldn't tilt over. In fact, I think you can look at maybe Apollo 15 or one of those, if you see those videos, you'll see that one of those landed with a fairly obvious tilt. And it just, the tilt just stayed there until you took off. Yeah, uh, just uh, on Jack's not, uh, point about the uh, honeycomb structure and the struts, uh, Mr. Armstrong put that thing down so gently, I don't think it crushed more than about two inches. And it had a it had a stroke of, of a, I think about a foot uh, on, on the pads. Yeah, and and also on the pads, uh, there was a there was a probe sticking down on each pad that was about five feet long and had a little switch on the end of it. In the original design, uh, whenever those 
probes would touch the lunar surface, it would mean you're five feet off of the the surface, and and they were wired so that diagonally, if any two of the four pa four probes diagonally trip that switch, it would shut the decent engine off so that it would drop the last five feet and crush those struts. Well, the crew said, nobody's turning my engine off but me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they changed the wiring on those to where it lit a light on the, on the, on the dashboard. And, and during the landing, you'll hear them say, contact light. When they say contact light, that meant that that lunar, that that light, uh, the lunar contact light had come on, which meant that the probes had touched the surface. And they, then they shut the engine off. Yeah, on that, on that, those probes, uh, there was a concern with the one that was right by the ladder. And I think they ended up taking that one off because uh, uh, if it was sticking up, it would be a surprise when they jumped down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Armstrong had pointed that out when, in one of his visits to, the, to Grumman, and they took that one off. So you only had three, two sides in the back. And uh, the, the engineering uh, was a little worried, although I didn't, again, it wasn't my area, so I didn't hear that much about it. But if you look at the lunar module, the descent engine bell extends almost down to the bottom of the pads. So if you land with the engine still running and you're on a, uh, a rock or some raised area, you have an enclosed engine. The engineer is worried about that. That's why they had that original design he's talking about. Crew talked them out of it. And they would shut the engine off, hopefully, before they, it, anything like that happened. And of course, nothing ever did. But when you hear, if you hear the actual air to ground, you hear, uh, it, uh, contact light, engine off, engine arm off, and things like that. So if, if you count the time that they actually were on the moon, the first words essentially were engine off. <laughs> and then, then there was that moment of silence, and then it was tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Grumman also had a, a pretty good reputation for thermal analysis, again, which was quite turned out to be very good because uh, when you get into the weight reduction and you have to take off various and sundry things, what's remaining, those uh, gold foil uh, sheets just reflected, uh, reflected the sun's energy and did a really good job. There was another change that was late and that was um, uh, the, the down firing thrusters they finally just determined that if you had enough down firing thrusters, it could damage the thermal protection on the descent stage. So pretty late in the game, they added these little uh, deflectors on the descent stage right under each of the four down firing RCS thrusters. And that turned out, uh, because it was pretty late in the game, to uh, maybe cause a, a bit of a calm problem on Apollo 11 because those, those uh, deflectors did not get modeled in the communications uh, analysis. And so when they came around to do the deorbit burn, the descent engine is pointing essentially towards the Earth. So the antenna has to point down, and if, it's, if the antenna is pointing right at that uh, deflector, you get multipath, and you, and that's why probably why. Plus, there may be another reason why we uh, had ratty calm early on. The other thing which was unusual about uh, eleven was that uh, Neil wanted to be looking down at the moon when they started the burn, and, uh, and so that meant that somewhere during the de power descent, they had to rotate 180 degrees so that when you got to the point where you pitched over, then he would be looking forward. If he'd have stayed where he was, he'd have been looking backwards and he'd have been look, starting to look up. That rotation also introduced the, the effect of loss of calm. And that was why uh, they had a call to go up and give him two new angles for the steerable antenna to regain high, high, uh, high data rate. Our data rates, the so-called high data rate was 51.2 kilobits per second, which is 
not much now. Low data rate was 2.4. So when you were went to the Omni antennas from that distance, you were at 2.4 kilobits. So that was pretty low. Now for my systems, it didn't matter too much. For but for guys that were looking at the computer downlink, they they might have lost it all together. So yep. getting that getting calm back was yep. pretty significant. Uh, yep for evaluating where the crew was and how they were doing. So that worked out, but, it, but uh, while we were sitting there, lost a calm, that was not a very good feeling. Yeah, you know, the, the lunar module had one computer. Uh, uh, there was a firmware backup computer, but it was just very, very small, and all it had was some programs to be able to get the ascent stage into a safe orbit so the command module could pick it up. But the, the main computer in the lunar module, there was just one, and it was a 64 kilobit computer. So one picture in your cell phone has more bits in it than that whole vehicle had. And on that, on that point, during the uh, testing uh, prior to uh, bringing LTA-8 down here and before, of course, before the uh, lunar landing occurred, uh, the primary system was called the PINGS, sorry primary guidance and navigation system, and the uh, backup abort system was called the AGS, the AGS. Uh, well, uh, during a lot of the testing in Beth Page, prior to shipping it down here, uh, we ran what's called feet tests, which is a full end-to-end -end validation of all the software and hardware, valve configurations and all that stuff. And, and invariably, for many, many tests that were run, Whenever we switched to test the eggs, the memory was gone. It was one of those self-test programs that used to pull the memory out, look at it, put it back, do that all the way through and back again. Well, if there was a timing glitch that it pulled it out, looked at it, put it back in the wrong spot. Next time it came through, bad data, bad data, bad data, bad data, had no memory. They finally figured it out and, and, and fixed that timing problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, MIT did all the uh, programming for both uh, lunar module computer and the uh, command module computer. Um, they, they were both essentially the same box built by Raytheon, but what was in the box were a series of cards that had uh, what they called ropes, but it was a, a bunch of magnetic core donuts interlaced with wires in certain directions that made ones and zeros. And though, but those programs were made up at, at MIT and they had to be separate programs for, you had a program for landing radar, you had a program for rendezvous radar, program for limb, the descent engine, programs for guidance, programs for uh, if, if they took a star track to locate where you were. Uh, and each one of those programs was called by a master program called a, uh, an executive. That executive was designed by a fellow up at MIT named, I think his name was Herb Fanning. You can find this online, by the way, and it's an interesting read if you are in that area or interested in that kind of thing. Uh, but it, the, its great feature was that it would keep running even if one of the other programs had a problem. It also had a feature that allowed for what they called interrupts. So when, when Buzz would put in a number like P68 or something like that, he was asking for something that constituted an interrupt. That interrupt took a little bit of time and it was, he, Buzz kind of figured out that one or two or three of the 1201s or 1202 alarms was associated when he put in a P68 request. So he stopped doing that. The other program alarm was uh, because the, uh, of the way the, um, I think the rendezvous radar had been set up and it was trying to track the uh, command module. It was, I mean, that was the whole purpose of it. But uh, in so doing, it got a, a set of angles that caused a, a high degree of computation to go on and that computation took a little longer than the main program allowed for it. So it hadn't finished and it was time to go on to the next thing and that caused a pro an executive overflow and that's what caused 
the, the couple of the alarms. So th those things we didn't know early on. They were simulated prior to Apollo 11. And when uh, uh, Armstrong aborted during the sim, uh, Gene asked his flight controllers to go look at, we need to understand these things, go back, they talked to MIT and figured out what every potential alarm could be and what could cause it and had that list available. But the main program was the key because as it, it, unless it got too many of those, it would keep on doing what it's supposed to do. It would do a program, uh, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, loop back, go to the next and, and so it would repeat all of those programs. And uh, the, it was designed essentially not to crash. So uh, that, that turned out to be a really elegant design feature. And I think those are still in place today in, in, a many, in many areas. Um, All right. How about let's take some questions. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Anybody have some questions in the audience? Yes, sir, over here on the end. Please stand up. Thank you so much. My question regards the frightening last few minutes of the landing, potentially running out of fuel, the dead man's curve, landing long, pegged on horizontal velocity to escape the boulder field. Can you tell me as much as you can about that? Because I'm fascinated. How the heck did they do that? Well, let me take a shot at that. I think they started the burn a slightly, a, a little bit late, a couple of seconds, that meant you were going to be long. So the FITOs knew pretty well early on they were going to be long. But there was a long landing ellipse, so it was still going to be in the ellipse, but at the far end of it. The, um, the other, you would mentioned some other things having to do with um, rate of descent. Uh, the, 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 there was a profile, and you can find it, again, find it online. Basically, when the engine started out, it, it could it'd run out, it'd it, it start uh, about 10 percent, ramp it up to 90-something percent. It would not run very well. It was unstable between 60 and 90. So they, they'd run it at 90 percent, or, or between 90 and 100 percent, for most of the deorbit burn, and you're just facing, you're just slowing down, and lunar gravity is bringing you in. At a, at a point called high gate or something like that, they start to pitch over. And at that point, lunar gravity is bringing you in and an engine is doing two things. It's slowing your forward velocity plus it's slowing you uh, going down. The crew had a capability to what they call redesignate. So if the commander was looking out the window, there were some marks on the window and it, he could, he could point the limb, look at two of those marks, line them up at a place he wanted to land, and, and click a button in the onboard software would say, okay, I'll go for that spot. He, they also had a, a, a toggle switch that would change their rate of descent. So when you hear down two and a half, down two and a half, that those were, well, some of the readings you see where it says down 20 or something like that, that's feet per second in vertical velocity. They could control that with this switch. They, then they were, ran across that cavity, the boulder field, and Armstrong, that's not a very good place, so he arrested rate of descent and went forward. So when you hear forward, 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 that's what he's doing. He's flying over that boulder field. And, uh, but the 60-second call and the 30-second call were calls that said, you now have 60 seconds to what we call bingo, and then 30 seconds to bingo. Bingo meant you had 20 seconds of fuel left to go to full thrust, punch up, and, and do an abort stage and get out. So if you assessed that you weren't going to make it, those were your points that to get out or, or abort points. They came close to that. Well, we, you heard the 60 second call, you heard the 30 second call, and he went a little, slightly beyond that but he was there because you heard, pick it up dust. <laughs> when I heard that, I knew he was going to land. <laughs> so. All right, next question, right here in front. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Stay up, stand up, state your name, please. Or not your name, just your question.
I wasn't. Oh, no, it was, it was, that was all in a different orbit. Uh, we, we didn't worry about that. Yeah. Well, I, I imagine there were some people looking at that, but they were, again, he said they were in a different orbit, so there wasn't any potential of crashing. If in, I think they ended up crashing into a mountain, but. Right here, yes, sir. Uh, that's a tough one to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you're saying it's scientific then? Yes, no, scientific they, no. Approach, yeah. Let me say, no. there were engineering had criteria. Yes. And the criteria were how, how, what's the maximum pressure differential that you could have between the inside and the outside, and then what kind of margin do you want to have? And typically structural margins would be 40%. So you would say, what kind of stress is on this skin? Add 40% to that again, for a 5 PSI delta P or something along those lines. So as long as you met that criteria, that you were good. Plus it was tested in the big vacuum chamber, which this vacuum chamber here at JSC could go down to 10 to the minus six tours, which is pretty close to a perfect vacuum. So you could actually test it. And this is a National Historic Landmark too, the only second one at JSC in addition to the historic mission control that's now been restored. Yeah, and oh, by the way, I'm sorry. And uh, the, uh, the part of the test process was to uh, take the uh, lunar module vehicles out to a field and pump them up to three times operating pressure. So it had to withstand 15 PSI, a delta pressure. If it didn't make it, it didn't fly. Yes, sir, in the red here, I believe. The um, the stages were held together by four bolts with pyrotechnic devices that would blow the, the bolt and the nut, I think. And uh, I think, uh, and in, also in between the two stages, there were electrical cables and there were gas lines for water and oxygen. And that, those, all those lines and cables ran through a guillot, what's called a guillotine. So it was a, it was an anvil and a, a sharp edged bar, and there was a pyrotechnic device behind that. So, and I think we used a Bort stage, so which which was automatically separate everything. Prior to that, however, for a normal one, we put the ascent batteries online, we disconnect the descent batteries, got the programs down, counted down, and the crew pushed board stage, if I remember correctly, and that separated everything and lit the ascent engine. So we took advantage of the automatic feature there. Yes, sir. Right. That, that happened on Apollo 14, and it was, I believe it was the only one where they decided they, for some reason, did not depressurize that Ca that cavity between the two tunnels. And the, uh, when you fired the pyrotechnics, there was a pressure wave in there, and that depressed and dented the lunar module top hatch. And that caused it to jump, dump all its gas, and so that, as one of the crewmen said, it took off like a scalded dog. <laughs> we lost data momentarily until the vehicle, the lunar module had automatically regained uh, attitude control and had its antennas pointing back and we saw, whoa, there's an empty, <laughs> empty cab. I was on at the time, as it, the cabin is empty. So, uh, and, and none of us, I didn't figure it out at the time, but uh, they later on got a little nervous because the CSM hatch also was subjected to the same pressure wave, but it was a tougher, heavier duty hatch, fortunately. And uh, so that's that story. That was Apollo 14. Yeah, they, they uh, if I remember right, on Apollo 11, even when, when they were ready to go out and, and do the spacewalk, 
uh, you open the dump valve to dump the pressure out of the limb and, and, and so you can open the door. And, and that door was a very large door. And I, and I remember they had a lot of difficulty opening the door because they had to wait till the delta pressure across the door went to absolutely zero before they could actually open the door. Last question. I think right it's about a 36 inch door, so you can multiply and you get nine square feet and so many square inches, multiply it by five, and you find out there's a lot of, it takes a lot of effort to open the door, and you don't have very good. Uh, yes, mechanics. sir. Last question. Ma'am, I'm sorry. It gets hard to see. What differences in the Apollo era limb compared to the upcoming like Orion and Artemis projects when those lunar modules are landing? What are like the major differences that you identify between the Apollo and upcoming limbs? Well, my shot at it would be I don't I haven't followed it enough, so I don't know what their pressure regime is. We went with five psi pure oxygen because you can get immediately get into suits and go out. On the space shuttle and the station, when you're at 14.7, it's much easier for the human because they're used to it. But it also means when you're going to go in spacesuits and drop your pressure down to eight or seven or five psi, you have to do a two or three hour pre-breathe to get all the nitrogen out. Yeah, well. So you can do that. So the, uh, that might be one thing that would have a difference. The guidance would be different because it's, gonna, it's got a lot more powerful computers. Now that has its pros and cons because. Yeah, but I think the big, the big difference would be the amount of processing power that will be carried on the, these later vehicles. I mean, even on shuttle, the main computers that flew shuttle were 512K, and that is nothing compared to what you're carrying in your pocket. So I think the, you know, the processing power is gonna be the big thing. They'll be able to do a whole lot more with the computers than they could do on Apollo and show. Yeah, there, there'll be a lot more software <laughs> involved because the lunar module and the command module back in Apollo, it, it was all hardwired switches and, and wires going from a switch to a relay and, and uh, there, there wasn't such a thing as a data bus. There, well, there was a data bus for the one computer that did a few things. But, but you know, today, fly-by-wire, all, all aircraft and spacecraft are fly-by-wire and, and all controlled by the computers. And, and that, that cause, enables you to, to save a lot of weight in the vehicle. If, if, you're, if you go down and land and you use the gateway concept, then what lands is supposed to all come back because it has to be refueled. We didn't do that with the lunar module. We just took one part of it, brought it back, and came home on a different vehicle. So there's a whole set of design goals that would be different for going back to the moon where you, have a where you expect to have a capability to reuse the same vehicle over and over again. The, the, the biggest difference is there's a lot of stuff to build on that was developed in the Apollo program. And, you know, a lot, if it sounds like we were winging it a lot in the Apollo program, we were. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we were, we were solving problems that nobody had ever thought of before. And, and you can take all of that knowledge now and incorporate it into the new program and, and uh, make things much better. I don't know of a better way to end it. Please join us in welcoming our panelists today. <laughs>